Warning, this podcast contains spoilers for the second episode of The Last of Us on HBO Max. Hello, my name is Jason Concepcion. And I'm Rosie Knight. And welcome to X-Ray Vision, the Crooked Media Podcast, where we dive deep into your favorite shows, movies, comics, and pop culture. In this episode, in the airlock, we're digging deep into the Last of Us episode Don't eat the bread! Don't eat it, no cake. And in Nerd Out, we're doing a very relevant theory from Brandon. Let's go, Brandon. And... uh, (laughs) What? If you want to, well, sh- supportive of the <laughs> theories, if you want to jump around, as always, just check the show notes for the timestamps. Coming up, the airlock. Folks, we're stepping out of the airlock into the overgrown and ruined halls of a colonial museum in cool. Back Bay, Boston, for The Last of Us, episode two, titled Infected. The show, of course, created by Craig Mazin and uh, Neil Druckmann, creative director of, of the game for Naughty Dog, EP'd by Mazin, and of course this episode directed by uh, uh, game creative director Neil Druckmann. Perfect timing as well because Neil's about to introduce the big bad. The big bad. The big boss, The big folks. boss. And he does it well. We open in Jakarta, Indonesia, September 23rd, 2003, a place where Joel at this time uh, was confused about its location. Didn't, yep. didn't exactly know where it was. Um, a military man enters a restaurant, interrupting the lunch of a, of a woman who is dining there. Her name is... Ibu Ratna, she is a professor at the University of Indonesia specializing in mycology, a.k.a. the study of fungi. The man takes her to the skier wing of a hospital and shows her some a specimen under a microscope. Uh, and uh, Dr. Ratna is like, oh, that's uh, Ophiocordyceps. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> which is a fungus noted for uh, its ability to, to take over and control ants. Mm-hmm. And uh, and she's like, oh, where'd you get this? And he's like, it came off of a, a human uh, specimen. She's like, no, it didn't. That's she's imp- like, absolutely no, not. No, it didn't. That's impossible. Cut to a even more secure part of the secure wing of the secure hospital. Dr. Ratna, now in full uh, biohazard gear, is uh, walking in to inspect uh, the victim that this specimen was taken from. The uh, general, very helpfully, <laughs> tells her... Get what you need and get the fuck out of there. As yeah, quickly. don't go close. This don't, is, <laughs> don't do it. It's just, just don't do it. That talk should come before I suit up, I feel like. They're not ever fully transparent <laughs> to the good doctor. They rob her out of lunch. They take her somewhere. She thinks she's being arrested. Yeah. Then they're giving her, you know, a little bit of breadcrumbs news until she gets into this room and learns the true horror. And the horror is that there is a young woman lying on the slab there, Dr. Ratna goes up, inspects the victim, finds a, a what is apparently a human bite mark on her Ugh. ankle, cuts it open with a scalpel. There's a spongy, fungal, mushroom material in there. This is shocking. Dr. Ratna then reaches into the woman's mouth and pulls out uh, a site we're all familiar with by now, Those all those wriggling worm-like... The kind like, of tentacle fungi ugh. that poke their way out creepily, and she just freaks out. She's out. She's out. All Come the on. way out. Later on, uh, she debriefs with the general. Uh, He tells her the victim was infected 30 hours ago in or around a factory that processes flour and grain. Uh, She says, oh, flour and grain, that's the perfect substrate, the perfect incubator for this fungi. Now let's stop here. Okay, let's pause because we're about to get to the big big theory. There is, there has been a theory out there that uh, obviously, this is this infection spread by bites. We've seen that. But how did it explode across the world at once? And one of the theories was bread. It, yeah. It got into the flour supply uh, and all these flour products that went out across the world, uh, carried it, and that's how everybody got sick at once. On top of that, there is the cake theory. I love this because this is... So in the game, a lot of people are like, is this the same as the game? Is In the game, there's a mention of kind of infected crops. Mm-hmm. And that's really about as far as it goes. But the cake theory is great. And you were the one who introduced this to me. And the cake theory is, if you remember in that kind of heartbreaking cold open, Joel forgets to bring a cake. 
yes. back for the birthday celebration with Sarah. And the cake theory, expounding on the bread and wheat theory, is that the reason Joel and Sarah didn't get infected is because they didn't get a cake. And this also does some really... I love it. It's so good. It's our Discord so good. brought this to our attention, yeah. and so thank you. I and also, exactly who I was going to say shout out, because the, the Jakarta choice is really, really intentional, because... In the first episode, we hear Joel and Tommy trying to work out where Jakarta is. So we realize this is happening so close and it happened so quickly. But as one of our incredible Discord users pointed out, Indonesia is actually home and Jakarta to the the biggest uh, flour processing factory on earth. So it's like a perfect place for this to have spread and for the wheat and flour theory faction to really kind of get a little bit of what seems like a confirmation, especially as, like you said, Jason, the doctor basically confirms that that would be a great way for it to spread. You know what's funny is in episode one, Joel jokingly tells the Adlers that he's on Atkins, meaning he's just eating meat, no carbs. And everybody on Atkins oh, made it. And day just, one. Wait, 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 wait. Everybody wait, wait, on wait, Atkins wait. made it. You just, <laughs> wait, wait, I just had a light. All the gluten-free no. folks, they made they, it. I had, a light, I had a light bulb moment just then. When we meet the Adlers, yeah. the son is feeding his mother biscuits. Oh! And oh, she's the first person. And Sarah that, didn't eat the cookies because she doesn't eat, like the raisin exactly. cookies. Exactly. And then she was the first person that we saw oh, who was infected. Shit. So I think the bread theory is really important. And as we will get to momentarily, uh, when we start digging into the rest of the episode, I think that it expands. It, 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 yeah, it goes, it, it goes going. to a dark place. A dark yeah, yeah we'll place. Okay, so we learn uh, again from the from the general that uh, an employee at this flower processing plant became violent, started attacking her coworkers, bit several of them, one of whom is this dead woman here on the slab, uh, and that at current time, fourteen workers are missing from the mm-hmm. factory. Uh, uh, Dr. Ratna is shook. She, yeah, she's it, horrified. She's horrified. She's unmoored by this. Uh, the general is like, okay, so obviously we came to you as one of How the, do we fix it? As one of the most foremost, you know, experts in mycology in the world. We need a vaccine. We need a medicine. We need something to stop it. And the doctor's like, I got you. Here's what you do. You call up. You're in the military. Call up your fighter wing and just fucking bomb the city. Yep. He's she like, said, what? She said, my whole life, I've worked on this my whole life. There's no cure. We can't do anything. There's no study. Come on. There's nothing. And you know what? It's a really brilliant reflection of the first cold open where the scientists sat on that uh, stage of the late night talk show and said, if this happens, we lose. I hate a quitter, but it turns out she was right. Yeah. Um, uh, She then tearfully says, hey, can I get a ride home just to spend the final moments here in civilization with my family? We go back to 2023. Ellie uh, wakes up in a patch of sunlight in this beautiful kind of like idyllic patch of grass in the middle yeah. of this former it's beauty so salon. Gamey. It's, it's just, wonderful. It's so It feels so wonderful. It's it, that perfect mix of bleakness and beauty that yeah. this story does so well. Joel uh, and Tess are watching her like hawks. He, uh, Joel has his rifle Joel's ready hand. to kill her. He's ready. He's, He's ready. can't wait to do it. He's like, show us your arm. Ellie does. No change. Uh, Joel and Tess have never, ever seen anything like this, but they're not all the way there to believing that Ellie is actually immune, and Joel is further away, certainly, than Tess is. Ellie is like, hey, so we got this far. Where are all the infected? I heard that they're just swarming out Mm -hmm. here in the open city. You can't leave the quarantine zone because you'll just die. And Joel's like, yeah, don't worry about that, which is Ellie rightly says, well, I'm going to (laughs) actually worry about it because it seems like a big deal. Tess then uh, is is continuously pressuring Ellie to tell her what Marlene's plans were. What did Marlene want with you? Ellie says that uh, Marlene found her after she was bitten, and then rather than kill her, which is usually what you do, she and the Fireflies watched her. They ran tests on her. Uh, you know, Tess is like, what Tess? And she's like, yeah, I held up my arm. I counted to 10. Except, and But mostly the thing that really impressed them was I didn't turn into a fucking monster. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, Bella Ramsey is, is just great. killing it. Okay, and let's stop here as well because this leads to another theory, right, that we spoke about briefly. Mm-hmm. Why didn't Marlene shoot Ellie? Now, this has to be directly tied to the fact that in the first episode, Marlene tells Ellie that she was the one she placed who put her in the Fedra, in the Fedra in the military school. school when she was a baby. So that hints to me that there may be more 
than one kid who they were watching for this purpose, which right. would be very different from the way it is in, in what we know of the first of The Last of Us uh, game. But yeah, I think that's very interesting. And the fact that Marlene didn't like, Marlene's brutal. The fireflies are brutal. That's the yeah. point. The fact that she didn't just shoot an infected person in the head means she knew who she, knew who she was. Right. Like she, she says she knew her real name. She tells Ellie that in the first episode. So this is definitely a thread to keep watching. At the very least, it lets us know that this is not Marlene's first rodeo with seeing if someone was immune. Mm-hmm. Like, she's done this. They had yeah. a system in place for exactly. testing. Exactly. They, they had a testing system. Yeah. Um, so Ellie goes off to uh, to do what one does when they wake up in the morning. And uh, Tess and Joel have a little conversation. Tess is trying to convince Joel that this could be real, what Ellie's... Ellie's immunity that might be a legit and that we sh- they should just go forward with dropping her to the fireflies and getting the truck from from them so they can go uh, find Tommy this is probably their best shot at doing that um, Joel is like I-, I don't know this is like more than we bargained for why don't we drop her back at the QZ and Tess is like if she goes back to the QZ she'll get tested at some point she'll come up infected and then she'll get killed and then we get nothing so we might as well do this mm-hmm. um There's a funny moment that follows, which is actually pretty meaningful considering our cold open, (laughs) where it's breakfast time. Tess and Joel are eating the most rancid looking jerky of unknown unknown meat source. It's so hard. It's like chewing on a ruler. (laughs) And they're they're really generous. They're like, oh, you know, you can have some of ours. And Ellie's like, don't worry about it. And pulls out this like huge chicken salad sandwich. sandwich on this massive bread. Let's talk about the bread. Okay, so <laughs> they, there's two. There's kind of like two variables here. First, option one, nobody knows that it was bread and flour. They exactly. Did, right? So they're just eating it. They're, they're, and they're just eating it. I guess like additionally to that would be the possibility that they know it's bread and flour, but they figured it out. You yeah, know, they yeah, figured yeah, out yeah, how yeah, to yeah. fix it, which I don't buy. Or the other option is that the fireflies know about the bread and they're feeding it to Ellie to check that she doesn't get infected. Or to build up an dun, immunity. Dun, dun. Which is incredibly bleak, but I also think very fitting. And I think it's really interesting because after that cold open, like the big chat in our Discord was like, why would they show her eating bread? So, and you know, nothing in this show is unintentional. Yeah. So I'm really interested to see where that goes. But I kind of love how we have that dramatic irony of us knowing that that be- bread is probably a death sentence if Tess and Joel eat it. But they're just, that's all they want in the world is just to eat this bread. And they're eating their nasty little jerky and they want to eat that. And they're like, is that chicken? Like yeah. everything is so, but that in itself is just completely wild, especially, and it highlights on a base economy level how important she is to the fireflies. Cause this yeah. is clearly, Joel and Tess are smugglers. They're out every single day yeah, she's like, smuggling. Yeah. And they're like, <laughs> where'd you get chicken? <laughs> and, and then she's like, from smugglers, but obviously, like, not you lot. <laughs> I think what, is probably going on here is that there are certain people in the know who understand that um, bread and flour were the thing that sparked this. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's not widely known. Um, And I think the fact that somebody can still make bread and get flour and stuff suggests, again, that there is, to your point, a kind of system in place to test people. Because you're not going to fucking find wheat and make bread for one person. Like you're exactly, gonna do it exactly, if there is a exactly. if there is a, a whole system going on of testing and make and finding out if people are immune. Tess wants to know why Marlene found Ellie so important. Um, and she says, you know, like, and you better, by the way, you better actually tell us or we're gonna bring you back. Ellie shoots back, well then when you won't get your car battery. Uh, and Tess is like, oh, you, oh, you heard that? Uh, then you must have heard that he wants to shoot you. And she looks at Joel and knows that it's true. Yeah, Joel yeah, looks at knows, her like, knows. yeah, I'll shoot you right now. Uh, and it's a really, really chilling moment. Um, and then we get this from Tess where she says, Joel and I, we aren't good people, so answer my question. Here's So playing the game and watching the show, mm-hmm. the game kind of goes into this more. But the the I sort of realized playing the game again that... Joel and Tess were on their way to being Robert. Like they were, oh, yeah. they were, Robert was like their competitor. Mm-hmm. They were like moving up the ladder of like criminal kingpins in the QZ. If they didn't kill so many people, they would have had an army. Yeah. But they killed everyone. They, like, they, they couldn't people. get an army because they kept killing everyone. But no, no, definitely like, I, 
I think that this episode and this series, honestly, just over these two episodes, like it's done so much to expand on Tess, who was essentially just like an outrageous like death dealer kind of like yes, serial killer yes. total psycho total psycho and like you know what that's fine because in the game it, it serves a purpose but even in such an emotional game that's definitely one of those things where in the show you're just like wow this is someone who no matter what they've done suddenly feels hope and suddenly wants to imagine something a bit better yeah. and you kind of don't really get to see that with Tess in the game until her last last moments but yeah. here she's really she's tired and even that in her last, last moments in the game feels more out of desperation yeah. and like, let's just like finish it than actual feeling. And also realizing how valuable Ellie is. Yeah. Um, Ellie tells them that uh, what she knows is that there's apparently a Firefly base camp somewhere out west where doctors are working on a cure and Joel finishes her sentence. Yeah, yeah, oh, he's yeah, heard whatever. it before. He's like... heard all this shit before. The key to finding the vaccine is me. And he's like, "Come on, this is Tess. You're gonna. This is what you're gonna buy. How many times have we heard this? There's no vaccine. There's no medicine. There's nothing we can do." Um, he still wants to shoot her, but Tess really is like, "Hey, listen. Again, the Fireflies believe it, so let's just do it." Yeah, exactly. From this scene, you are getting now dialogue just directly lifted from the game. The first was more of a, a loose adaptation that brought things from the game. Yeah. This episode is so close it really to is. what you see. It's actually quite wild. Like I, I was playing the game, then I was watching it, then I was playing the game, and I was like, whoa, whoa, I'm really just seeing stuff being directly pulled. And this conversation is one of them. And kind of where the episode goes to these terrifying, nightmarish places, that is just so brilliantly adapted. One of the lines that uh, is ripped straight from the game is Ellie saying, hey, can I have a gun? <laughs> Which she asks about a hundred times. Who can and they blame her? Like... Like, uh, they say no because who wants to get shot in the back by a panicky 14-year-old? Like yeah. yeah. Um, and she's like, well, I'll just, I guess I'll just throw my sandwich uh, at the infected, which, again, <laughs> I, I think they'll like it because it's, you know, part of their history. <laughs> they then head off into the kind of like sunlit wreckage of Boston. They're passing bomb craters. Mm. Chess is telling Ellie that, uh, as Dr. Ratna suggested, um, they just bombed the, the city. The American government at least came to came to the realization that their best course of action was just bomb the fuck out of cities. And it didn't work everywhere, but it appeared to work in Boston where they managed to set up the, the quarantine zone. Now, they come to like a place where a building is partially collapsed across the street. So this is the direct pass, path to the old state house. So what's left is the short path and the long path. And apparently the short path is like, you will get killed. Yeah, it's the, it's the, it's the long path or the you die path. <laughs> yeah. and, and Ellie's like, I think I'll just yeah, take this that. long path. So they go through this hotel. And here's a very telling moment that kind of dovetails nicely with what you were saying before about Tess, the difference between game Tess and, and show mm -hmm. Tess in the way that this Tess, there's almost something vaguely parental about her and the way she talks to Ellie. Notice that Ellie walks next to her this whole time. Yeah, Doesn't yeah, walk yeah, next yeah, yeah, to Joel. Yeah, yeah. You know, Joel did say, like, I will kill you. <laughs> but is walking next to Ellie this whole time. Uh, and they're, you know, and then Ellie, Tess is being very generous about telling her about the dangers mm -hmm. of the open city. She asks how Ellie got got bit. Ellie's like, oh, I went into this, the mall in the QZ that's blocked off um, and I got bit. Uh, Tess asks, did you go in there alone? Ellie I think lies and says yes. I mm -hmm. think she was in there with someone else who we're yeah. going to find out was the person who was her significant other. And Tess is impressed, and you can tell that Ellie is really feels she really she's feels not getting good many about compliments. It. She feels good about the fact that someone is like you. And I think like she sees in Tess that's someone that she would want to be like. You know, someone who can survive this for twenty years, who can kind of thinks it's badass to yeah. go into an empty mall and get bit just for the sake of it. Like, very chaotic behavior, but really, it's a chaotic world. And yeah, I, I love to see that with Tess. And also, again, they do a really good job where like you get those moments in the game, but here there's a lot more kind of quiet time yeah. for them to walk. And we get this really fun conversation about like the different kinds of zombies and like oh, the yeah. threats that, like, because all, all Ellie's ever heard is rumors. So that's a really wonderful part of this scene because you know Ellie is like looking at this I mean the city is in ruins but it's beautiful mm -hmm. 
and she's like, what the... She was. She's almost disappointed that it's not as dangerous as everybody yeah, yeah, says. Yeah, because, no, because the whole idea is they keep you in the quarantine zone yeah. by telling you the moment you get out. You're it's, like, it's like You're walking dead, dead walkers. Yeah. They're coming to the fences. They're going to eat you. But when you get out there, it's beautiful. It's overgrown. Nature has kind of found its way. And so far, she hasn't seen a yeah. single... Zombie. So she or goes. Infected. So so there aren't the ones with the split open heads that see in the dark like bats and Tez and Joel are like. Ah, they just ah, they look at each other like, and they're like, ah, I guess we'll uh, we'll keep that one. At, at which point you hear the the um, trademark screech of yeah. an infected and Joel is just like, okay, let's just keep moving and uh, let's go. They come to the flooded lobby of a hotel, which Ellie recognizes because she reads books. Uh, she is really having fun. Like, she's turning this into an adventure. It's obviously mm-hmm. very dangerous, but she's never, again, been outside before. And she goes to the front desk, rings the bell, does this whole little scene about <laughs> checking into the hotel. And Joel's like, you are a weird kid. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, you are a true weirdo. But you know what? It's really nice because in the game, Ellie's always, um, she's like always singing and like being, trying to teach yeah. herself how to whistle and doing like weird yeah. shit because to her And laughing normal. and like little laughs when yeah, you see yeah, her yeah. looking and stuff. Because it's normal, like yeah. it, she's getting to explore this world but the horrors of the world and the fact it's broken down are not new to her. Like that's all she's ever known. So that, yeah, I love that scene and Bella, they just sell it so well. They're like kind of talking and checking in and Joel's just like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> Eventually Joel and Ellie get their first moment alone when Tess has to find an alternate path through a, another part of the building that's collapsed. Um, and Joel compliments Ellie's switchblade. She seems Classic like she's Joel. skilled <laughs> with it. Hey, nice, nice name. knife. Nice knife. <laughs> um, she asks where he's from. He says Texas. She uh, she asks where Tess is from. She says Detroit, which is in Michigan. And Ellie's like, I know that because I went to school. <laughs> the parallels with Sarah and, mm-hmm. and geography are right there. She then asks how Joel Tess and Tess know each other. And how Joel got to Boston, Joel's like, no, we're not talking about Pass. me. No more <laughs> questions about me. She then asks, uh, how long do you think Infected live? Uh, and he says, a few months, but some have been around since this all started, since, you know, 20 years ago. Yeah, those are the ones you uh, you don't want to meet. Yeah, and she asks if he's ever killed any, and he says, yeah, a lot. <laughs> uh, and she asks, is it hard knowing they were people once? And he says, sometimes it was. And then she asks him, what, you know, how hard was it to kill that soldier? Mm-hmm. You know, when he had that flashback to the to the night uh, on the riverbank with Sarah in his arms. And before he can answer, Tess returns. And she's got bad news that, hey, so the way we have to go, it's just all infected. Yeah, it's an you know, infected like, party. You know the long way that was supposed to be the safe way? Yeah. Now the long way is also the dead way. Yeah, yeah. And there's just, like, infected everywhere. And it's it's all bad. But we do learn something very interesting here. There's This is a cool episode if you want to know about the cordyceps virus yeah. and the infected because we kind of get to learn through Ellie's eyes a little bit more about them. Yeah, you see the sun kind of moving across the uh, the landscape, you know, as clouds kind of go across the face of the sun. And as the sunbeam moves across these kind of, uh, this lolling like hundreds, crowd of, yeah, of infected, the they floor. all react to it in unison. And Ellie's like, oh my God, they're connected. And Tess says, more than you know. And she tells them that those fungal tentacles they grow underground too and they're mm-hmm. like a, f- a fungal web like an internet for the yeah for the it fungus. creates like a hive mind yeah and if you step on a patch of those tentacles uh it can send a message miles away and alert bring the, tr- alert the hordes and here they come and i believe that is new as well that is that very is new. very new yeah and tess again is being very warm in the way she's delivering this she's she's she even says something to the effect of, listen, I'm not telling you this to scare you. I'm telling you this because you need to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you're immune, but but you're not immune to getting ripped, ripped apart. apart. I love that yeah. line. She's like, yeah, you're immune to getting bitten, but you're not immune to like a zombie coming and like tearing your limbs off. Like, sorry, babe. But And then bad news. The short way is the only way now, baby. Through the museum. Through the museum, a beautiful red brick colonial uh, covered in fungal tentacles. Yeah, the door is literally like locked shut. <laughs> Joel goes over. Um, touches one of the big tentacles. It is bo- it's bone dry, and he says, "Well, you know, it's- maybe they're dead. Maybe they're dead. Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. feeling positive." Uh, so they get ready to head in. Flashlights come out. Uh, Tess and Ellie, you know, have another talk. Tess is like, "Listen, you just stay behind us. We're going to move very slow. If anything happens, you get between me and uh, Joel." Um, and then the guns come out. Now this is an interesting moment. So Tess 
uses that uh, uh, alternating flashlight pistol overhand grip, Mm -hmm. wrist over wrist, and then later in the episode says, at the very end, says to Joel, save who you can save, which is a very 9-11 era first responder thing Mm -hmm. to say, and it makes me think Tess was a cop. Yeah, definitely some kind of first responder kind of situation, and also... Very, it fits in with what we know of Tess, which in the game, the little things that we get to see about, she's usually the one who's giving Joel stuff to uh, yeah. to fix his wounds yeah. and wrap it up. And they do a nice inversion of yeah. that in this episode. But yeah, I thought that was a really great catch from you. And again, you know, Ellie just wants a gun. Yeah, she's like, give me a gun. She's like, I've got a spare <laughs> hand. And Joel's like, good for you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> hey, we're going to a dark building. Can I have a gun? I mean, <laughs> this is like, if you've played the game. I've never shot a gun, but can, but I, can have I have one? one? I mean, surely, weren't they teaching you that at the federal mi- <laughs> military school, though? I feel like they should, well, they probably didn't want the kids to have yeah. guns so they could escape. But still, I feel like that would have been probably a good idea in the context of this. So in here is where we get our first view of the clickers. Now, Joel and Tess are, are initially feeling pretty good. They find this, uh, like this group of dried up and dead infected, so they think, oh, good, they're dead. But then flashlight pan over to the side, and there's like a body that's been dead, like, Two hours. And it's like it's like ripped apart, like his throat's ripped off. Ellie's freaked out because Ellie's like, I've been bitten, and that's yeah. not some it couldn't have done that to me like this what is this and tess's face like, the fear on their on their faces it's is so good yeah the way she's like well maybe uh maybe he died outside and then, maybe he got bit outside and, 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 he, and he crawled, crawled in, in and, and then, the, you know they know that that's they, not true they don't want to see it yeah they, they don't, don't, don't want it they don't want it and it tells coming. you if two badasses mm-hmm. like this who have killed lots of infections and survived like 20 years yeah are scared, then this is serious. Joel then tells Ellie, okay, listen, from this point forward... Silence. Silence, okay? Have you seen that movie with John Krasinski and Emily <laughs> Blunt? All right, did you see that one? No, that didn't come out yet. Didn't Before, come out It didn't ever. come out yet, sorry. So- Never came out. Okay, but it's like that. Yeah. Not quiet. Silence. Silence. No quips, no, like, strange bits about being yeah, yeah, yeah. in a hotel. Just like- fucking do it and yeah. don't say shit. Uh, so they go forward, and they're you know they creep their way forward. And at one point, Ellie steps on a dried vine, and they're just like, "Oh shit!" And then there's like a building collapse on the stairs, and they're like, "Oh shit!" Um, they eventually get into kind of one of the display halls, um, and behind them, as they go up, the staircase collapses behind them, which draws the attention of a clicker. You yeah. hear it screech first, and then you hear the as it's searching, you know, with its audio waves, it comes up, uh, and Ellie is crazy with fear. You can see it yeah. on her face how absolutely terrified she is. And then there's another screech, and now it looks like, oh, shit, there's two of them. Mm-hmm. Joel gestures to Ellie. He says, like, you know, saying essentially, hey, they're blind, but they can hear. They can hear. So sh- uh, she's freaking out. The monster is coming close, coming closer, coming closer. And then when it turns to them... What a great job they did on the creature design. Like, oh, it's uh, unbelievable. Uh, porting the design over from the game, but then obviously the detailing, the scariness, the mm-hmm. way it, it looks like something out of a Guillermo del Toro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's so good. Like, I was just uh, saying this to Vasilis before, like, our super sound guys, like, that when you play the game, you see the yellow outline you yeah. see the the implication of a fungus but you're so busy trying to kill it and yeah. and it's scary and a lot of times you see them outside though i have to say the museum they adapted it perfectly this yeah. was the first time when i played the game that i got scared and they yeah. really translated this that. is directly from this the is game. directly directly and, it, from and the game. It, it's it's that moment where you go more into that classic horror video game yeah. style you're in a dark space you're lighting it with a flashlight you've got to be stealthy but I didn't expect them to be able to pull off the clickers and make them something so horrific. Like, yeah. Guillermo del Toro is a great pull. It's very Resident Evil. The kind of only sign of their humanity is this, like, gaping maw with broken teeth. And then on top of their heads are these, like, it's fungus, but it's also, you pointed out, it's, like, plating. It's, yeah, it's almost it's, like a dinosaur, like a triceratops, yeah. but, like, with fungus growing on top. It's truly horrific stuff. And even though, I have to say... Pretty much everyone that I've seen loves this show. But if you were waiting for the episode where it becomes like a scary zombie show, this is the oh, episode. Yeah, this is it. Um, so it's it comes close. It swings its face towards them. 
uh, into the beam of the flashlight, which whoever did that, don't do that. And, <laughs> Please don't and, do that. And Ellie gasps, and now it's fucking on. And one thing we can say about this these version of the clickers mm-hmm. is they are way hardier than the video game version. The video yeah. game version, they take some gunshots, but if you get, like, two headshots, it's going to go down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The thing that I Depending find, on your difficulty depending level. On how, <laughs> I was going to say, I'm very bad at headshots, yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. I'm more of a four or five person. But you know what I will say? I'm going to be very interested to see how the clickers take it later on because what I ended up finding was very easy no matter my difficulty setting is once you start modding your melee weapons, you can kill them in a couple of swipes. Yeah. I wouldn't want to get close to one of these clickers to know how that would go. They're like, horrendous. It, yeah, they they supercharge them and that kind of berserker mode where after you shoot them once and yeah, they come like, to, <laughs> that is just horrific here. The fight is on. The first clicker, the one that's closest to them, takes like four or five bullets oh, yeah. directly to the torso. No reaction. Is fighting with Joel like nothing happened. Which kind of makes sense if you think about it because if it's if it's just the body is essentially a shell. Yeah, that's then it. Then why would it damage it? You know, you have to get to that, that cerebral cortex or wherever the mo- main fungus is. Uh, shoot the head like every, exactly. every, every, every zombie, zombie movie. movie. That's the rule. Uh, Tess and Ellie run. Big, big fight. At the end of it, they do take down both clickers, but and Tess is okay, except for Tess a twisted is ankle. Great, She's she looks good. Fine. She says, "I'm fine. I twisted my ankle. That's it. Okay, yeah. well, let's move on." Ellie got bit again, uh, <laughs> and she's like, "Well, at least it was me. Hey, <laughs> if it had to be one of us, right? We're fine." Uh, and they go out over the roof. Um, they get on the roof. Tess is looking at Joel. Sadly, as mm-hmm. he's taping her up. I love again, this moment. That moment again, out of the game. you get and you get this like these moments. Something that I love about this show that it understands about the game is these like moments of like empathy and compassion and comfort and these tiny moments that people can have together. Like when he's wrapping her foot and they're kind of talking. And again, you go from this deep, dark, horrific halls where you're kind of chased by this nightmare monster onto this beautiful sunlit rooftop with this broken down cityscape. It's such wonderful juxtaposition, but it never feels kind of jarring. Yeah. It's just like a really nice breathing kind of spot. And we get another, you know, Joel and Tessa having this moment. And then you get this unbelievable shot of Ellie kind of as they traverse the, yeah. the piece of wood, which again is one of the most memorable scenes from the video game. Now there's a, there's a small interaction here that I think tells you a lot about Joel and Tessa's history. Joel is like, hey... So, you know, maybe you know, we don't know what happened with that first bite. Maybe this is the bite that'll that's push gonna her get over her. the edge. It's going to get her. <laughs> and Tess snaps. She's like, can you just take the good news? You know, and maybe this time we can actually win. Mm-hmm. And it, it, what it suggested to me, and I thought this was great writing, is that contra the game, Tess was the more hopeful one. Yeah. In Joel's, their relationship. Joel's Joel was dead killer. inside. Yeah, Joel. Joel and in the, in the game, he's dead inside, but it's like... He's dead inside and he just follows Tess and does yeah. whatever she wants. But here, he's dead inside and that allows him to do the terrible things that yeah. need to be done. Whereas with Tess, Tess can take it, but she's tired of giving it out. She yeah. wants that little bit of hope. She doesn't want to be killing people. She wants to imagine that this time they can actually win. Yeah, this this felt like a window into their relationship. That maybe Tess is the person who's like, oh, maybe it's real this time. Maybe we can do this. Maybe mm-hmm. we can do that. Whereas Joel's like, this is never changing. This is what we're doing right now. Um, Joel goes over to Ellie as Tess uh, stays behind to kind of tape herself up and you can see the state house across the way it's beautiful under the sunlight Um, and as they move out there's a great moment where Joel glances at his watch and just like takes one look at the broken watch Uh, they get to the state house Firefly convoy is there in front of the building no sign of the Firefly themselves (laughs) suspicious Uh, yeah not good (laughs) Joel goes up he checks the truck it's streaked with blood there's dead bodies all around torn apart by infected blood uh, trail that's leading up into the state house Uh, and, and Ellie's like oh they went inside Tess now grabs Ellie by the arm and rushes in because she's ready to like she's done she's ready to find out like what is it real what's next probably you know depending on you know probably because of the reveal that's about to happen because she is one she's in, she is inspired by and buoyed by and really deeply touched by like this sliver of hope that she's feeling and also like hey if there is a cure, can we cook it up real quick? Can I have it? <laughs> yeah, like, can, can I maybe have it? Yeah, like, we... how's it going? How's it going? So they get in there and everybody's dead. Uh, and Joel reads the situation. So 
one or more of the fireflies got infected. There was a fight as the healthy ones fought the sick ones, and then everybody lost, in Joel's words. Tess is then like, okay, well, there's got to be a fucking map or a radio or some kind of indication about where Ellie was supposed to go. And Joel's like, eh, it's, we're Who done. Yeah, we like, did it. It's done. Like, yeah, we she, did the We thing. dropped her here. Let's go. Let's go home, he says. And then Tess snaps, it's not my fucking home, which is like a hugely uh, revealing comment, mm-hmm. again, from Tess, who... All the while, you know, again, it suggests all the while, all the while, all the way Tess has been, like, hoping for a real place, a real end to this. Uh, and then she says, you know, my luck had to run out sooner or later. I'm going to stay behind. And Ellie gets it. Tess was bitten. Uh, Joel is shattered by this. She, you know, Tess shows him the wound, which is on her neck. And it's already, like, fungused out. And like, she's like, look at Ellie's. Like, this yeah, is, like, like, three weeks ago. Like, what the fuck is wrong with you? This is... This is real. Because look at this. Exact dialogue from the game where she her reaction is like, oops, right? You know, yeah, like yeah, that yeah. Um, Tess then begs Joel in an increasingly emotional appeal to take Ellie West to find Tommy and his group and to s- stop this, to cure this Yeah, she's thing. like, your brother was a fly- yeah. firefly. Like, if it, anything, he knows. Joel is like, they won't listen to me. They're not going to listen to me. Like, I don't, I've never been a firefly person. And, and he's like, I don't want to do this. Yeah, like, I, I have no investment in this. This is, like, your thing. And Tess is like, you can do it because they'll listen to you. And you need to keep her alive and set everything right and please say yes, Joel. Um, in that moment, an infected corpse, you know, shakes to not life, afterlife, whatever you call it. Joel walks over, shoots it. But that corpse happened to be laying in a pile of the cordyceps uh, fungal net, uh, which transmits the uh, the signal to a nearby horde, and you can hear them screeching, growing louder, and they'll, they'll be there in about a minute. Um, Tess is like, okay, I'm going to stay and hold them off. And this is when she says to Joel, save who you can save. You know, you, you can save her. I can save you, and I'm going to stay here. Joel then races with Ellie out of the building, drags her out. Ellie is like, no, we're not leaving not her. Not leaving her. Like, what are you talking about? Again, this, like, naive innocence, the the childlike, why can't we help mm-hmm. kind of feeling. The, the same thing that um, that Sarah displayed on the night yeah. that everything broke out, which is like, why aren't we stopping for that family? Behind them, the building explodes as Tess with her last strength ignites her cigarette lighter, which sends up barrels of gasoline and loose hand grenades, and and Joel heads off in the direction they need to go with Ellie, just kind of shocked, staring at everything. Um, knowing, without spoiling how this is going to go, um, if for people who, have played the, who haven't played the game, I think one thing that's important to, to get here is how much everybody but Joel wants to save the world and help people. Yeah, 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 exactly. Joel's relationships are defined by the people closest to him. That's He's a, his, he's a selfish guy but it, at it, his core. He's selfish, but... In a really, in a understandable and humane, in a way that it, you can relate to. It expands to. almost like a, like a force field, like yeah. an invisible woman force field around those he loves. And... Yes, it's going to be really it's, it's going to be really important and I'm very interested to see where this goes because so let's talk about test dying. This is almost identical to the video game. Almost Except identical. Except in the video game she's killed by Fedra soldiers. Right. So I love this choice cuz I think that it's really interesting that now we we have the two people Joel's loved, one was killed by soldiers, one was killed by infected. So mm-hmm. it adds that and I'm very interested in the game. Joel does not take this death well, and no. he and he takes it out on Ellie, kind of like in in a way that he he sees her as the reason that this happened. Ellie apologizes profusely in the moments in the game. Yeah, after this happens, for, and Joel's like, "You cannot talk about." Yeah, Tess. don't talk about Tess. We're not talking about and Tess I, anymore. Don't say her name. I'm interested to see if if they go the exact same route because that's a really. It's a really rough, like, emotional journey for the two of them. I agree. But, yeah, I'm just, like, I, so many people in our Discord were just so upset that Tess died. Anna Torv is so good. She's so good. That even though I knew where this was going, it still kind of shocks you because you're just like, she was so good. Didn't you want to keep her around? Didn't you want to take her to Billstown? Didn't you just want to imagine what that role would be? Spoiler but she, alert, Billstown. Billstown. 
Uh, if you watch the end, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, if yeah. you that that may be the name yeah, of the yeah, next yeah, chapter yeah. of the game. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm very. I just think she was just so brilliant in this role, and also. Now, somebody in our Discord did say that they think the first season is going to be the first game, and that that had been confirmed. I have not read it, but I, I will say, true. the speed that this is occurring does make that seem like it could be possible. Yeah, I agree. The speed that we are going through the events of the game. I mean, we're already at this point about 15 levels into the game, you know, 15 yeah, yeah, yeah. missions into exactly. the game. Exactly. You're, you're, this is the end of chapter three, and there's 12 chapters in in, in the game. So I'm... I'm very interested because I would abs. I think that would be one of the bravest choices that we've seen in TV for a long time to not stretch out to five seasons, to just not do that expansive kind of wide world, long term storytelling yeah. that The Walking Dead did to get to a point and to instead understand that that game has one of the most heartbreaking storylines and to just tell it in one season and what you do after that is what you do after that to deal with the fallout. Now I think people are surprised at how quickly Tess went out even though as you mentioned she does go out in the same exact portion of the story the game version of the story that she does in the in the television version of the story but well first of all it feels like you spend a lot more time with her mm -hmm. one because she kills about 100 people in the in the, in the in <laughs> that's that time. the predominant experience yeah. of Tess in and the game. you know depending on how good you are at the game you could spend you could have by that time have spent anywhere from five from three hours to ten hours yeah exactly her, exactly, exactly. All the time. somebody in our discord had a really funny comment that alerting the first clicker ellie gasping validated his play style which is being bad at stealth <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I I have to do stealth. I was pl I've been playing the game and like if I try and go chaos mode, I'm the opposite because if I go chaos mode, I lose. I I lose every time whether it's a clicker, yeah. especially if it's a soldier. But yeah, it's it's really fun. This is just such a good show and I I think they're making a lot of really interesting choices. I agree. Because also as well, this is a show where twice now within the first two episodes, they faked you out on who your main cast is going to be. Mm -hmm. Because when the first episode you think it's going to be Tommy and you think it's going to be Joel, that's true. And you think it's going to be Sarah, that was not true. Then you think it's going to be Tess and Joel and Ellie. And again, you lose one of them within that episode. So I think it's going to be very interesting to see how they keep people on the edges of their seat. And the best thing is, as someone who's played the game, the show is still completely engaging and it's really fun to see how closely they're adapting it. But I've seen, and this is my thing that makes me most excited, I've seen so many people who've never played the game in our Discord, online, reviewers, who just are absolutely invested. It's really well done. After two episodes. It's really well done and a great story. And I think one of the things, two episodes in, that we can kind of count on is how they're going to fill in the blanks of the game. I mean, there's significant blanks in the mm -hmm. game. We don't know. Mm -hmm. There's a lot about the Fireflies we don't know. There's a lot about how Fedra works that we don't know. You know next to nothing about how the fungus spread. And the fact that, you know, episode one, mm -hmm. you get all this interesting backstory. You follow Sarah for a lot longer than you uh, initially think that, you know, considering how long you follow Joel. Episode two, you get how the fungus broke out. I think that is going to be, is going to continue to be how this show uh, improves on what is already an excellent story told through uh, through video games, which is by filling in all these blanks but with uh, flashbacks, with all the stuff you didn't see in mm -hmm. the game, um, and really keeping the stuff that's ripped directly from the game as the more kind of like suspenseful, yeah, thrilling, yeah, yeah, exactly. action stuff, the, which is what the game does so well. Replicating yeah. those moments of, like, real horror. Yeah. yeah, I'm very interested as well to see if every cold open is going to be a different scientist because yeah. they've kind of set that up, and I'd really love to see maybe how it impacted people all over the world. You know, Chernobyl was very much about, like, showing how things break down mm -hmm. in this kind of human bureaucracy, like, slow time. And I feel like these cold opens are kind of interesting touches of that. So I, I'm really excited to see what happens in the, the cold open for episode three. Later this week for our Friday episode, we're going to be covering uh, the video game in the second installment of our coverage of The Last of Us video game. So check back for that. And of course, we're going to be covering The Last of Us on HBO Max every Wednesday in your headphones. Up next, Nerd Out. In today's Nerd Out, where you tell us what you love and why, or 
as you have been doing recently, share a theory with us that makes you excited, which is obviously we love theories. The tinfoil hattier, the better. But so far, I have to say, we've been getting a lot of very sensible theories. Yes. And, uh, and yes, so the new, we have a new theory from Brandon that is about how a real life incident could possibly inspire the way that the MCU chooses to introduce mutants. So Jason, do you want to read the theory? Sure. Hi, Jason and Rosie. Hi. I've been behind on podcasts and catching up, but every time you talk about mutants needing to be hated and feared, I have a thought and forget to send it in. I think there's a really great and effective way to do it that the audience would buy immediately, make it a pandemic. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. kind of use this idea with Terra Genesis during their Inhumans arc, and I think it would work really well in our post-pandemic time. My two cents, thanks. That's a fun uh, fun theory, Brandon. I, I, so... That Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. arc is ripped from the comics. Yeah, the Inhumans, Terra Genesis, and kind of the way that they get their powers, which is you have to go through this process where the Terra Genesis brings out your powers. There's definitely a way with mutants, because Terra Genesis and, is very similar to like the mutant gene being activated. We know that in the Weapon X program, and even if... Even in like the Deadpool movies, which everyone's really familiar with, mm-hmm. there's this idea that you can activate a mutant gene. So they could definitely do something where an illness or a global pandemic activated people's mutant genes. So you don't have to deal with that kind of analogy of, oh, mutation is an illness, but you could talk about like how it be, how it coming out of an illness could affect people, make people scared of it. And also it would be a very interesting way to bring real life into it. I think a lot of people are ready to see TV and film that actually deals with or talks about the pandemic that we have lived through, that we are living through, you know? So I think this is really interesting. The Marvel comics don't have a great history of doing like illness analogies with mutation, but I would love to see a thoughtful way. And I do think that there's something in that idea of taking inspiration from Terra Genesis and making it something where the mutant gene is actually accelerated Mm. or and then you could have mutations in all different ages as well if they have the mutant gene but it hadn't been activated yet you know that's what happens to deadpool in the movies they kind of activate the gene through this horrible uh process of like torturing him and stuff so the idea of some kind of pandemic that rather than giving people powers just activates a mutant gene would be i think really interesting and also you know the mcu i like the weirdest stuff everybody knows that but the mcu has long been grounded in this kind of idea of finding real ways Mm. to bring and also i I think that there's something really interesting to talk about about like superheroes and disability and superheroes and chronic illness and all that kind of stuff and that's not often really deeply explained so again if it was through an illness or something there's lots of interesting kind of connotations and and ripe ground for exploration there now fun fact the pterogen bomb and terogenesis uh you know the kind of elevator pitch of that storyline was that uh, a bomb filled with pterogen mist was detonated uh, in the atmosphere causing uh, lots of people who have the latent inhuman gene to develop powers. Including Kamala Khan. In, including Kamala Khan. Now, fun fact. This was done <laughs> in Marvel Comics pre-Disney's acquisition exactly. of Fox as a way to bring the mutants to the screen without Without actually using them because they didn't own the ip at that time exactly so at the time there was it was quite hard to find a fantastic four comic because they didn't own the ip it it had been licensed away and it was very hard to find a comic that was solely focused on the x-men and the terrigen bomb and the terrigen mist and people like kamala khan who was originally pitched as a mutant but then became an inhuman in the comics through that it was basically hilarious editorial edicts to basically say, look, look, we do have them. We, we hey, do we have got, these heroes. Yeah, we got them. We got this guy who can't talk. His yeah. voice is too loud. We got a cool dog. Yeah. Everybody loves that dog. Well, everybody loves Lockjaw. Come everybody on, guys. Loves Lockjaw. Lockjaw, you can teleport, guys. I actually would love to see Lockjaw. <laughs> I, I would listen. love to see Lockjaw in, like, in uh, Ms. Marvel season two. Listen, but yeah. Pet, of pet Avengers. Sat, We've talked oh, about it. You know, him, we are the Pet screen. Avengers superstars. Yeah. But you know what? The real truth is we all saw how the Inhumans TV show went down. Like a lead balloon. And uh, <laughs> if you even remember that it happened, you can watch it on Disney Plus, though. Yeah. Um, it's very strange. has an unbelievable cast, but it, it didn't... Bad wigs. I Bad wigs. Also, they, they shaved off Medusa's hair in the first episode. Her power is literally that she has prehensile <laughs> hair. So as soon as they did that, you knew there was going to be a problem. But, yeah, I I would be very interested. I wanted, I, A lot of people thought that Miss Marvel was going to introduce Inhumans. I was always hoping it was going to be a mutant story. 
But I'm very interested to know if the Inhumans have a future in the MCU after we saw Ants and Mount, again, great casting, come back for that really memorable moment in uh, in in Multiverse of Madness. I, I'll be very interested to see if there's a universe where the Inhumans are the major heroes and whether or not that comes into play as we get to this kind of mm. inevitable secret wars convergence, yeah. kind of like multiple universes in one. Just no legacy virus type, uh, type exactly. situation, That's please. That's not what we want. Yeah. No, thank you. Thanks, Brandon. If you have theories or passions you want to share, hit us up at x-ray at crooked.com instructions in the show notes. That's yeah. it for us. Rosie, anything to plug? Uh, you can follow me on Instagram and Letterbox. That's my only social media. Uh, Rosie Marks with an X. I will be writing a bunch of stuff in the lead up to Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, which obviously we are very excited about and we'll be getting more excited about in the upcoming weeks. You can check out my writing at IGN, Nerdist, Polygon, Den of Geek, all kinds of good places. I've got a big Den of Geek cover story coming out soon for a currently unannounced uh, cool thing. Uh, Jason, what about you? Where do people find you? You can find me uh, in your podcast feed every Wednesday every and Friday. Every Wednesday and Friday, right here, right here. Right here. Me and, too. And uh, that's about it uh, for right now. Watch Primo when it comes out on Amazon Freebie sometime, I don't know, in the spring and or summer of 2023. Uh, and we'll catch you on the flip side. Five-star reviews, five-star ratings. We want one, no. We want two, no. We want three, no. Four, Keep going. Five, yes, perfect. We want five star ratings. Five, we want five, 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 five <laughs> star ratings on your podcast review rating platform of choice. Here's one from Bill's Preston. Love this pod. Thank you, Bill. X Ray is at the top of my list of awesome pods. I love listening to Jason and Rosie, the depth of their comics. And pop culture knowledge is amazing. Super pumped that the show is coming twice a week in 2023. That's oh, right. It is. Let's do it. Twice a week. We're pumped too. See you next Friday. Oh, yeah. And if you want to read a transcript of the show, something I'm very excited about, they are posted beneath the show notes on the Crooked website for each episode within a 48 hours of you being able to listen. So it's a great way for more people to be able to experience the show. Catch the next episode on Friday, January 27th. And remember, we're bringing you two episodes a week, two, 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 two episodes a week. That's twice the episodes, twice the deep dives two times the everything else subscribe to us on youtube where you can now watch full episodes of this show plus follow the at xrv pod handle on twitter and check out the discord come to the discord folks it's great the water is nice it's a great place to meet and hang out with tons of amazing fans and listeners plus rosie and i are there 